Well, never thought I'd be back like this. I initially didn't like this direction with the story. There was just something about the storyline that just hit me. Why is he wearing a normal outfit? This game has done something that no other game has done to me. It made me lose faith in a franchise I love. Wow, well, never thought I'd be back with this outfit, but here we are. So I've been hearing your requests. I'm well aware that even with Personathon done, you still want more Persona productions from us. I mean, who wouldn't, honestly? Yeah, and as you can see, we're back for another duo review. For those new here, I am deeply in love with the Persona series. I went as far as to talk about every mainline title alongside Strikers, so it's safe to say I'm kind of an expert when it comes to this franchise. But I know what you're all thinking. What's next? With mainline games reviewed, how can we outdo ourselves? Well, I'm very happy to say that I'll be reviewing over a game I'm sure a lot of people have been requesting. This little game has been announced right as our Personathon productions were releasing, but due to time constraints, we ultimately couldn't include it. That's right, we're talking about Personified Tactica, baby. <laughs> I know, I know. Nobody cares about this game, and I know how many of you want that reload review. It's all P3 this and P3 that. To that I say, we'll get to it. Look, as much as I could and do want to talk about Reload, I first want to actually make a review on this spin-off here because this has to be one of the most polarizing games in the franchise. I would even go as far as to say I absolutely hate this game for what it stands for and how Atlas went around treating it. Tactica has become one of those rare cases that the more I think deeply about this game, the more flaws I start to see on it. My relationship with this game is one filled with many ups and downs, all the way from its reveal and being fairly optimistic to just having my heart crumble from how much it neglects the development and ideas that were built into these two here. So join me and Captain as we try to dissect both the good, the bad, and the very ugly in this title. This is our review on Persona 5 Tactica. Before we start, I just want to say that if you're enjoying our productions, or if you want to see more stuff like this or Personathon, be sure to press that subscribe button. Also, while you're at it, please watch Personathon. Anyway, let's get down to business. Before we begin on the game itself, it's important to see how it all started. So, one of the main reasons this game was even created is pretty simple. They just wanted to make a strategy RPG spin-off, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Surprisingly, Atlas does have a lot of experience in this genre, most of it stemming from the Devil Survivor series, actually. So, in a way, I can definitely see why they'd want to take a jab at doing this with the Persona brand. As stated by Wada, he saw this as a good opportunity to, quote, expand the possibilities of the series. On top of that, business producer Atsushi Nomura shared how the Phantom Thieves as a concept fits well with this kind of gameplay. In all honesty, I can't argue with that. One of the things I love about the Phantom Thieves from a story and gameplay standpoint is that they can be very versatile for most genres. They already did it with a hack and slash and look how well that turned out. Making a tactics or strategy based game in the likes of Fire Emblem would be a fun way to experiment with new ideas. Like I said many, many times in the past, I'm not against Atlas milking or doing more projects with the Phantom Thieves, so long as they bring a good amount of value to their existence and bring something new to the table. It's nice to see that Atlas greenlit the idea too, just goes to show that the developers really do have a lot of freedom in the kinds of projects they can work on. As I was doing research for this section, I tried my best to find when they realistically started development, and while nothing is confirmed, it's safe to say that it most likely began right after Strikers was released. It wouldn't be too surprising, since with the success of how that game went, it's likely they wanted to capitalize on making another experimental take on the series. So good on them for wanting to try something new. And as many of you know, this game was initially announced alongside this on the summer of 2023, with a release date of November 17th of the same year. In any case, now that we got that out of the way, why don't we take a look at the story? Captain, you know the drill. Oh, all right, the story. Well, as usual, the story is... Somewhat simple? So basically, the game takes place a little after defeating Yaldabaoth. We start off with a little foreshadowing of who we're going to eventually deal with in this narrative. Ooh, what could they be planning? Not much can be said other than it's some decent setup. That all changes once we go to LeBlanc, where the Phantom Thieves are currently at. They're just hanging out and having a good time with each other. However, as this is happening, it's being reported that there's a new and upcoming Prime Minister, Toshiro Kasukabe, who has gone missing. Before we could think much about the situation, a strange chain of events begins. The TV starts having unusual behavior, the room shakes, and we see a strange looking door in the entrance of LeBlanc. So we go inside and we get transported to this new world. From here on out, the story takes an interesting turn. 
So once we get transported to this new metaverse-like place, the Phantom Thieves are under attack from this new villain, Marie. Her goal is to plan out the best possible wedding with someone who she has held captive and is stopping anyone who is a threat to it. So for that reason, she takes control and possesses the majority of the main cast, all but Ren and Morgana. I initially didn't like this direction with the story, like at all. I never liked stories where they simply grab a bunch of main characters, make them fight for the enemy side, and it revolves around you gaining them back for a final battle. I was legitimately scared they were gonna do that, however, that doesn't happen. You save all of the Phantom Thieves very early on with lots of missions before even fighting the boss. On top of that, you're not just playing as the Phantom Thieves for this game. Meet Arena. She's one of the main catalysts and helps us understand better what's going on in this world. So, to put it simply, Marie is organizing a wedding. As for Rina, she's a leader of the Rebel Corp, an army who wants to overthrow her from her authoritarian rule on this land. So when Arena sees that you're also going against Marie, you both decide to team up to both save the rest of the Phantom Thieves and stop Marie for once and for all. As the both of you are going through that journey, however, you stumble across... Toshiro? Wait, the same Toshiro who went missing? Who would have guessed? Anyways, it is now up to you, the Phantom Thieves, Arena, and this Toshiro guy to stop Marie from marrying, well, Toshiro. Yeah, I forgot to mention this part, so now it's kind of a good time. Just about everything that happens in this story revolves around Toshiro. This entire world you're trapped in is in Toshiro's cognition, meaning this Marie is meant to be this Marie. She, in the real world, is actually a CEO of a company who wants to marry Toshiro. This is because he's gaining a lot of positive influence as an ex-prime minister. However, despite having a ton of influence, his father needs financial backing to make his plans a reality. So he decides to help out Marie, so long as she helps out with funding for Toshiro's political campaign. Keep in mind I'm leaving out Toshiro from the picture here, and that's intentional, because Toshiro has essentially zero say in whatever is going on. Meaning, he's essentially running for prime minister with intentions that only benefit his father and his future fiance. This is only further exemplified through the rest of the main story. After we defeat Marie, we get transported to this brand new world set in an ancient Japanese setting. This is where you actually start having confrontations with Toshiro's father, and even meet Toshiro's mother. Honestly, this is where the game really really shines. I never mentioned this, but I absolutely hated Toshiro in the beginning. It was nothing personal, but he was just so annoying. He kept playing the pacifist since we met him, saying stuff like, oh, we shouldn't fight guys, or this is too dangerous. It was until I actually got to this part of the game where he really grew as a character. The thing about Toshiro is that throughout his life, he's constantly been abused. And what's worse is, he was never able to defend himself in any shape or form, ultimately just accepting how cruel the world is sometimes. This doesn't just apply to his family, life but it was also demonstrated with Marie and his school life as seen in the world after this one. The only thing he wished most was be able to spend time with his mom. Unlike his dad, Toshiro's mom was a very caring person and loved him. However, she wasn't able to see him often because she had to go to the hospital constantly due to health problems. All Toshiro wanted was to one day be able to go out with his mom to somewhere fun, like a theme park. And surprisingly, he did his best to make it happen, which had worked. Toshiro took his mom out and both decided to go somewhere to enjoy themselves. Sadly, however, that didn't last for long. Because soon after they leave, Toshiro's mom dies in front of Toshiro, making this part of his everlasting trauma. Just... wow. You know, I don't like this game for a number of reasons. But getting to experience Toshiro's development and how he overcomes all this trauma is honestly one of the best parts of this game. It's honestly amazing to see Atlas commit to this kind of character with this backstory in a spin-off of a spin-off of all things. Most of Toshiro's development revolves around him needing to overcome his fears and fully confront those abusing him. From his fiance to his father, to even confessing to the public for letting himself take orders from these kinds of people. This ultimately makes the people lose trust in him but he's willing to accept that and even do his best to regain his public image. That's really damn good writing, oh my gosh. And that's just Toshiro, we haven't even touched on Irina yet. However, the more we learn about her will be the point where the game really shows its cracks in quality. But let's talk about Arena first. I absolutely love her. Arena is first seen as a very humble yet determined kind of person. She knows she doesn't have the strongest army compared to Marie, but she's always doing her best to make sure she succeeds in her revolution. Coming up with clever strategies around the weaknesses of her enemies, keeping everyone fired up, and overall just wants the best for everyone. 
Also, her design's absolutely adorable. I really like her. We also do see a bit of conflict between her and Toshiro's beliefs. I actually really enjoyed the scene and even does do some clever foreshadowing for who Arena is. I guess this is a good way to talk about it now. So, to put it simply, Arena is essentially a manifestation of Toshiro's repressed will to rebel. She serves as a way to protect and help Toshiro through these traumatic thoughts. It's a very similar case to Futaba's shadow when exploring her palace, where instead of the user's shadow being a threat, they actively try to cure and help the person in their cognitive thoughts. Only this time, however, she's an active fighter who helps the phantom thieves. That's really damn cool! What I don't like, however, is it's exactly what happens in the third act of the game. So, up until this point I stuck around talking about the first and second worlds, palaces, dungeons, actually wait they're called kingdoms, alright. Basically focus on the conflicts being brought up by Marie and Toshiro's father. This third and final section focuses on Toshiro's school life. So, in here we get revealed that Toshiro in the real world was working alongside another student called Eri Natsuhara to call out the principal Ichiro Nakabachi for blackmail and abuse of the students. This is played through a few flashback scenes as we progress through the story alongside a voice talking to us through some speakers. Logically, this makes us think that the ruler of this world is going to be Nakabachi, right? That actually doesn't happen. You see, there's a bit of a twist here. The school and the victims do get revenge at Nakabachi in the real world in the end. But around the same night, Eri and Toshiro just celebrated and have a nice chat at the train station. However, we see Nakabachi who is absolutely destroyed like Jesus. Wait, is nobody going to call the police with this weirdo around? Anyways, this monster here makes Eri fall off and fall on the tracks and no joke, she dies. W what? This leaves the phantom thieves in a panic. We got rid of supposedly Nakabachi. How are we still not done? Where's the fall? After the flashback, Arena is completely kidnapped. I'm gonna be very honest and say this actually had me on the edge of my seat. While Toshiro's school life wasn't as interesting or deep as his relationship with his parents, seeing Eri and him getting to know each other and wanting to make a better future for everyone was a true highlight of the story. So, who was this mysterious voice in the end? Well, there's none other than Toshiro himself. Or well, more like a shadow version of him. Uh, wait, what? You see, unlike Futaba's shadow counterpart, he is basically a personification of Toshiro's fear and repressed emotions from all his trauma. Ultimately, he decides to kill Arena and keep Toshiro as how he's always been, weak and scared. This angers him, however. After reflecting from his past, he doesn't want to lose the will to keep fighting. This also brings in a pivotal moment too since Arena reveals that Eri never died. In fact, she survived from that fall, and all she wants is him to keep on fighting, bringing justice and making the lives of others better. This only gives Toshiro one last option. After confronting every single bad person in his life and overcoming his trauma, he does what he must. He no joke. Summons a persona what oh my gosh this is so freaking cool oh my gosh this persona looks so badass I love it what's his phantom thief outfit gonna be he he doesn't have a new outfit <sighs> looking back on the story I thought I was being too harsh while the game had some glaring flaws in the beginning the middle and up until this point I really grew to love it however this is only the start of the downfall let's cut to a chase what why is he wearing a normal outfit? Did Atlas forget how important this is? Having a phantom thief attire isn't just a cool piece of clothing, it's a symbol of how much a character has actually grown as a person. We clearly see that Tojiro is rebelling against his own cognitive self. Why did you bother making him rip off that mask, give him a persona, but didn't bother to actually make him represent that? Now, I get what people are gonna tell me. One of the defenses that I see a lot is that we're in Tojiro's cognition, so he doesn't really see himself as a threat. Uh, yes he does. There's a shadow version of himself, who is clearly trying to like control him you could have at least given him the attire for now or something i don't know oh and don't even get me started with how broken this whole cognition toshiro has i get it he has to go through each part of himself to overcome but that's not how palaces nor jails work at all there's no way some normal person can have a cognition that's so broken that you have to go through different eras of the world futaba has just as bad trauma as toshiro how is she given a palace but toshiro's mind is the equivalent of a maze Oh my gosh, I don't even want to talk about Samael. Uh, get this. Right after you defeat Shadow 
little Toshi roll. You think everything's done, right? Ha <laughs> ha No, of course not. Because this is Tactica. Because get this, we have another God Finale. Oh my fucking God, I hate this game. I know what people will tell me. I know that Strikers did it and I praise that game. But here's the thing. It actually kind of worked in a way, even if it was terrible too. The God itself was being an AI trying to like give peace to the population and whatnot. I don't know. I just don't like these endings at all. They're so bad. But in here, it makes even less sense. How are you telling me that Toshiro's cognition is so fundamentally broken that he needs to confront an entire god inside his mind? How does that even work? There's no explanation for this. There's nothing. He just appears out of nowhere. That's like saying after defeating Maruki, guess what? He was just possessed the entire time by a new god called Zeus. Cause why not? I mean, if Tactica can do it, why shouldn't Maruki? Oh, that would make a perfect ending, don't you think? Just forget any sort of development and backstory we made specifically for him. Oh, and that's not even the worst part. You defeated Samuel, and everyone's happy, right? Nope, it just never happened. Don't even- <clears throat> Don't even bother- Hi, <laughs> my voice. Don't even bother mentioning the existence of this game because it never fucking happened! Sorry, sorry. It's just that this game, I have no idea what they were thinking here. But well, sadly, that is a very big issue with the narrative, and it's one of two major problems. While Toshiro and Narina have some of the best development in the game, the Phantom Thieves are barely even the focus. Even with the little screen time and dialogue given to them, they just don't do anything. While Persona spin-offs aren't new to Flanderization, in Tactica it really feels at its worst. The characters essentially have one defining trait to the point that it's part of their vocabulary. Futaba just straight up just talks with some weird gamer slang that doesn't even exist. Futaba loves video games, sure, but she actually knew how to talk well. Normally, who the hell says they're leveling up? This applies to basically everyone with whatever the writers could have thought of. Now of course, I'm not asking for every character to have some brand new arc, but at the very least they could have at least done some interactions or references to what they've gone through. Maybe even better, just don't have the Phantom Thieves. They just feel more like walking pieces of cardboard that just had to react to whatever is coming their way. It also just makes the story super bloated like you got Arena, Toshiro, Ren, Morgana, and all of these guys along. Why do you need so many if they're not gonna contribute anything? If anything, just have Ren and Morgana in the entire story, have everyone else possess. I don't care. Also, can I ask, where's Sojiro in all of this? It's never explained how LeBlanc is magically going through these different worlds. Heck, what even happened to a LeBlanc in the real world? I can't imagine Sojiro going back to a cafe only to see a giant empty space where it could have been. Please, Tactica, if you're going to have these strange rules, make them make sense. But at this point, why even bother getting this mad? I don't think I've ever gotten this mad at a game, and here we are. All in all, while Persona 5 Tactica does have a lot of major highlights like Arena and Toshiro's development, a lot of the bad stuff just makes the experience significantly worse in my opinion. Let's hope the gameplay can make up for it now. Bunny, you're up. Tactica plays very similarly as other strategy-based RPGs like Fire Emblem and even a bit like Mario plus Rabbids. You move around any character in your party in a grid-like map. You can take cover, shoot enemies, and even use your Persona. So the way it all works is simple. When an enemy isn't taking cover, they'll be in a nervous or tense state. This helps you to be able to knock them out with whatever attack you use on them. By doing this, the game will give you a one more move. Ultimately, this means that you can move to another area or even attack them again. You want to heavily focus on taking out enemies from their cover in order to get as many hits with the one more mechanic. You can do this in a number of ways, like doing a melee attack or simply using a persona. The mechanic may seem a bit too simple, but trust me, knowing how to synergize with your party with this is so much fun. Part of the appeal of this battle system is knowing how many hits and kills you can get with one turn. Oh, and that's not even mentioning the triple threat. Get this. Let's say you successfully knocked down an enemy, but there's a handful of other ones near him. If your other teammates surround them in a triangle form like this, they can do what's called the triple threat. This is basically a snappier and mini version of the all-out attack. I love this so much. Not only does it make dealing with waves of enemies much easier, it also adds another layer of strategy to the game, getting everyone not only to synergize with their attacks, but also be aware of their position to do the ultimate move on them is so engaging. That's not even mentioning how personas work in this game. So while you can take enemies out of their covers pretty easily, it still can be a bit of a challenge. Your gun is essentially useless unless you want to chip damage, and the only way you can really get them out is by using a melee attack, which you probably shouldn't do that when there are other enemies close to each other. However, you can count this by using your persona. 
Using a magic skill here has very good range, and it doesn't take the cover into accountability. And depending on the actual skill, you can do all kinds of things. For example, if you use an AGI-type spell, not only will it push the enemy from where they were standing, it also has an AoE property around it. This is very helpful for dealing with multiple enemies out of cover. There's also Bufu skills which have a chance to freeze your opponent, making them unable to move for an entire turn. Heck, you can even do status ailments. I will say, however, the way personas work here is a little different. They behave more like support and give you better stats alongside 1-2 to two new spells for you to use. On top of that, just about everyone in the cast can use them. Do keep in mind that you can only have one equipped at a time, so that's a good way to balance it out. While using personas may sound broken on paper, they'll still waste SP, and what's more interesting is that there's no way you can actually regain it aside from redoing the mission. Not only that, the same logic behind the one more strategy applies to you as well. Meaning if you, for some reason, decide to stay out of cover, the enemy can abuse that and also do a few attacks on you. And can I just say how much I love this mechanic where if you knock down an enemy from a high platform and have another one below you, they'll actually attack them as they're flying. It's so cool and another great move to do for that extra turn. Outside of combat though, there's really not much you can do. This game is very focused on the Phantom Thieves aspect of the game. You don't go to school, you can't walk around in the small hub area, and there's no confidants. The only true resemblance of it are in the skill tree that every character has. You gain what are called GP points, mostly by progressing the story, doing these small dialogue exchange scenes, and doing side quests. Look, I hate to be that girl, but there's barely any variety in enemies. For the First Kingdom, you only fight like three kinds of enemies. The basic ones, these strong ones who attack back at you if you're close enough, and these drummers who do buffs. To be fair, they do add brand new enemies in the Second Kingdom, but in the last one, I can't name any more that they introduced. They just have a mix of the ones from the previous two on here with the tendency of bringing reinforcements. This just makes the game to be very repetitive and overall a slog to get through, and at worst, it makes the missions blend into each other with very few even standing out. Believe me when I say that the main things making some of the missions memorable are the locations and music. It's sad, because they do seem to have tried with the gimmick variety. The Second Kingdom has this door switching mechanic where you need to have one of your characters standing on a button in order to move around. It's easy to get lost with what buttons activate what doors, but at the same time it did keep me more on check for where I want to have my party. The problem here is that while these are decent ways of making the game feel fresh, they're only the exceptions, not the rule. The First Kingdom is full of the same kinds of missions. Kill all the enemies, make it to this glowing rectangle, ooh, and if you're lucky, kill every enemy with a set amount of turns. What doesn't help is that the environments are just as samey. Atlas was able to make different looking locations with their own music and aesthetic, but wouldn't it be cool if they gave this game the Persona 5 Strikers treatment too? Take this mission for example. You're taking down enemies inside a party. Why not have, I don't know, that giant cake over there be used as a weapon? Tip it over, make a mess in the place to give you an advantage in the fight. <laughs> or heck, have a mission where you're setting off bombs in the prison to break free the Rebel Corps members who've been captured. It's moments like those that can make a mission so much more memorable and impactful to the story. Alright, alright. Maybe I'm being too harsh on it. While there are some glaring problems here, I'd consider these more like opportunities they could have taken but didn't in the end. As a whole, the gameplay for Tactica is... uh... pretty good, I will admit. For what it does, it does really well. The combat system is genuinely amazing and so engaging. It's just those small problems and missed opportunities that pile up and could have made this an even better experience. It's hard to say how much time Atlas really had to develop this game. Based on how the final gameplay is, I don't think it was that much. With that said, why don't we get into the reception? Uh, about that. Oh, right. So, the thing about Tactica is we just covered what the base game has to offer. For some reason, Atlas decided it was a good idea to make a completely separate campaign sold separately as DLC, and this has to be probably the most blatant attempt at this sort of practice. Also known as Repaint Your Heart, this is a completely new storyline that features Sumi and Akichi from Royal. However, not only does this take place before the events of Royal, it's also not canon like Tactica. What is the point of this entire game, then? Despite all that, I'd actually argue this is way better than the base game actually. No, really. I personally enjoyed Repaint Your Heart much more than what Tactica itself did. So what's the story then? Well, it's pretty easy. So Ren receives a message from... Sumi, actually. 
so we go ahead and meet her by ourselves. She called us so we can check out this odd graffiti on a mural near LeBlanc. The thing about it is, this is no ordinary graffiti, it's a giant hamster biting our scent. This was somewhat disturbing, but it did leave us curious. Right as we investigate the scene, Akechi comes in and checks the situation too. So we talk for a bit and see what this could mean, but moments later, the graffiti sucks us in. We get transported to this new world and we're back to our phantom thief attire. Well, to sum it up, you're now in a brand new location called The Streets, an urban-like world where Guernica has control over and is killing anyone in her way. Which, during all this and trying to avoid her, you meet this one girl named Luca, who claims that Guernica is actually her sister and she called the trio so they can save her. One of the main reasons she's even doing this massacre is because her mind was corrupted by this one bird she has named Jerry. Great name, by the way. So it is up to you, Akechi, Sumi, and Luca to bring Guernica back to normal and defeat Jerry. Well simple and sadly we do have another god ending here. It's much easier to look past some of the flaws here even if there were some paper. Let's start with the positives. I really really like that we only have the royal trio for this story. It just makes the narrative a lot more focused. It also feels like they're able to contribute better as a team. We got Akechi who's the brains of the investigation while Sumi is here along for the ride and just trying to help out where she can. It's pure fan service at its finest. And that's just the trio, we haven't even gone to Guernica and Luca's character. So basically the streets behave similarly to Toshiro's cognition, with you seeing certain things that represent what's going on in Guernica's mind. However, it doesn't feel as logic breaking as the kingdoms in the base game. I like to think that the streets are a mix between a palace and jail. You have a very open area with different locations. Though, once you deal with the true culprit behind the world, that graffiti you use to get in just vanishes. Whatever the case is, I personally really liked Guernica and Luca's backstory. These two were basically sisters who grew up alone, and while they've stayed without a home for the majority of their life, they had each other and their passion to do art to keep going. Not just that, one of the biggest reveals in the end is that Luca is actually a cognition of Guernica's sister, who sadly passed away. This revelation was strong enough that it broke Guernica out of Jerry's control, and is now helping us defeat them. I'm being really honest here, I loved hearing about these two and seeing this interaction. Luca throughout the story expressed how worried she is for Guernica, and to hear what both of them went through, there was just something so heartwarming about the storyline that hit me. And like I said, while there are still some glaring problems with the story as well, mostly ranging from how the characters behave and, again, this sadly is seen as it has never happened, I'm willing to look past it for a few reasons. One of those being that this game is very, very short. It only took me around 5 hours to finish, and despite that, I really enjoyed my time with it. This goes without even mentioning the actual gameplay, which, why don't we get to that now? I'll be sure to keep this quick. So in all honesty, not much really changes from the base game, though what there is, is just as significantly better and, dare I say, even more fun than what it had to offer. One of the main things this campaign does is introduce paint. What it does is that when an enemy is standing on paint, they're 100% vulnerable to your attacks. Even if they take cover, if they're still exposed to you and you hit them while standing on your paint, it counts as a critical hit, giving you a one more move to perform. This changes everything. It makes the game so much more challenging and engaging, not only by having to plan out a good chain of attacks, but also to make sure your paint is the one your opponent is surrounded by. That way you can abuse the one more system to its fullest potential. You automatically splash a bunch of this paint by shooting or attacking an enemy. Not only that, there's these barrels you can shoot or push to cover even more ground. It's this one simple but unique addition that really makes the game keep you on your feet. Do keep in mind, however, that everything I just said also applies to you too. So be careful by not stepping where the enemy's paint is. Which, that just adds more fun to the challenge. The missions are also really creative too, offering new obstacles like these drains that can actually be very helpful if you need to deal with the heavy enemies. Like Tactica's core gameplay, it's all about how you use the tools that are given to you that will help you beat the game. Also, can I just say that the music here is so much better and memorable compared to the base game? I don't know how much priority Repaint Your Heart had, but by the looks of it, I see so much more passion put into it. I'm being serious about all this, I really do feel like the DLC is so much more fun than the actual game. It brings some very creative ideas, has a very unique setting, uses characters that we have never seen in this spin-off campaign, and is overall just a very short but sweet time. On to reception then. Let's see, sales wise it did poorly. It sold around 50,000 units within its first week in Japan. To put it into perspective, Striker sold around over 160,000 in the same time frame. And that game only had like two platforms back in its release. To add salt to the wound, not even a month later after its release, it was already going on sale for $20. I seriously spent $80 on this game. If that doesn't tell you how disappointed it makes me feel, I don't know what will. 
Safe to say that this game was an absolute flop. To be fair, Atlas really didn't do much with this game. While the Japanese branch seemed to be better at promoting Tactica, the West almost despised the game from the looks of it, not being able to share it around online, barely any marketing, all of the same problems you can expect with Soul Hackers 2 have been made with this game but in a much greater extent. If it did poorly at the least, it was loved by the people who actually played it, right? Right? Uh, yeah, it's kinda complicated. The consensus behind this game is that it's a decent time, but not really a great game, with most people giving it 6 to 7 out of 10s for it. For a good while before it's released, it felt like this game never existed and very few actually wanted to bring it up. Now after actually playing it, it's really easy to see why it is. <sighs> you know, I just want to make something very clear. I never intended or wanted to hate on this game. Ever since it was announced, I wanted to keep a very open mind. Maybe, just maybe, this could be a game that I could love as much as Strikers. The reason I love Strikers so much is because it is a game that really exceeded my expectations ever since it was announced. So to see Tactica do the opposite and break my heart even after trying to give it a chance over and over again, I just couldn't anymore. It was because of this game. This game and Reload really made me want to just abandon doing Persona productions. I couldn't get myself to finish this game. It was that bad. Seeing the ending, seeing everything that goes wrong, and only seeing people now hating on Persona 5 really made me want to move away from doing Persona productions and the fandom. It's really hard for me to say this because I love Persona. Persona 5 was one of the first games I played that got me into the series. Even after trying so hard to stay optimistic, pre-ordering it, trying to give it as many chances as I could, this game has done something that no other game has done to me. It made me lose faith in the franchise I love. Not the Persona franchise itself, rather the Persona 5 brand. I wanted this game to be amazing, I actually thought that they learned from the dancing games. I wanted Atlas to prove people wrong and overcome the odds, but ultimately it didn't achieve that. What it did was taint the public perception of P5, made the hatred for P5's milking even louder, and it will always remain as the P5 spin-off that nobody wants to acknowledge. Always living under the shadow of the other title announced alongside it. Tactica, to me, is a middle finger for all of the great things P5 built up towards, and the people who were hoping it would have been something special. For whatever this game does do decently well, there's two other things that make me despise it. I don't think there's ever been a game I felt genuine disappointment to. Should you get Persona 5 Tactica? Well, if this is anything to go by, sure, give it a chance. Maybe it's something you can appreciate despite its flaws. But as for me personally, it'll take so much more to have hope with the Phantom Thieves again. This is Karyoe from Mintjoy Pictures.